Well, good morning to you again. I am so glad that you're here today. Get your worship guide out, if you would. Click your pen open. Today we're continuing a series called What's in Your Name? If this is your first time with us, you may be thinking, oh no, I'm coming in the middle of a series. That's all right. We're just a couple, of, a couple of episodes in, and it's totally fine. All these episodes stand on their own. If you want to go uh, back and see uh, any of the other ones, though, you can find them on our YouTube channel and on our website as well. But here's what we're doing. We're looking at what the Bible says about people who have put their faith in Jesus for salvation, people who are truly Christians, okay? If you've truly accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross, when you recognize and admit, hey, I'm a sinner, I know because of my sin I'm separated from God, but I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin, and so I accept what Jesus did on the cross by faith I receive him and make him the Lord, the boss of my life. You are saved, you are forgiven, you have eternal life. The Holy Spirit lives in us now and helps us experience his best here. But once that happens, the Bible, there's thousands and thousands of phrases and words that describe what we are and who we are and how we should act and how we should be. And so that's what we're looking at. We started off a few weeks ago talking about uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created. You were created on purpose for a purpose. Last week, we said that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, okay? And so no matter what we face on this planet, no matter what we face in this life, we can overcome that. Not just conqueror, but more than conqueror. You remember the Greek word is hyper Nike, okay? Hyper victorious, overwhelmingly conquer no matter what. Today, we're kind of continuing that theme with this. I want you to write it down there at the top of your notes. God says, I am salt and light. God says, I am salt and light. And I cannot think of a better place to talk about being salt than Saline County. Amen? <clears throat> Am I right? I mean, everything around here, we talk about salt all the time and salt. And, and now, we don't say saline unless, you know, you're one of those hardcore folks, but Saline. But we are salt and light. As a Christian, you are salt and light. So turn to somebody next to you and look them in the eye and said, hey, we're salt and light. Go ahead and tell them. You ready? How do we know that? Matthew chapter 5, the great sermon on the mount that Jesus preached, just a couple of chapters long. And here in the middle of this sermon, right after Jesus goes through the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are those who seek peace, they are called peacekeepers, God will bless them. All these blessed, 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 the Beatitudes. Then he says this, Matthew 5, starting verse 13, watch the screens, you ready? You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a lampstand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Here's what I know about salt and light. Salt and light and these qualities that Jesus says that we are, are give us distinction. These are things that are very distinct. Now, the word distinct means recognizably different. If something is distinct, it is recognizably different. It is distinguished. It is set apart. Jesus is saying that for us as Christians, we should be set apart. We should be different. You know when something has salt on it, right? Especially if it's got too much. You can tell. It's there. You know when there's light because there's no darkness. Light and dark cannot coexist. And as Christians, we are called salt and light, meaning that we are to be different in order to make a difference. Did you get that? We are to be different, distinct, set apart from everything else in the world in order to make a difference. What's that difference? Well, around here at Midtown Church, we say to help people find and experience God's best. We want people to be saved. We want them to miss hell and make heaven. We want people to experience God even in the midst of all the junk that goes on here in this world. We want people to find and experience God's best. And so if we're going to do that, church, listen to me, if we're going to do that, Christians, we must be different. We cannot be like the rest of the world. We have to be different, and not just for the sake of being different. And, and by the way, I'm not talking about being strange and goofy and crazy and creepy either. All right? <laughs> Amen to that. But we should be different in order to make a difference. Now, 
Some of you got real excited when I started talking about this. Uh, some of you are, are pretty pumped because you're thinking, this is it. This is the message I've been waiting on our preacher to preach. This is, it's time for us to stand up and fight, and we've got to fight against our culture. And we've got to, and some of you got all worked up. I want to encourage you to do something right now. Whew, chill out for just a second, okay? Easy, big fella. Today, before we go any farther in this message, I need to tell you something. We are not talking about fighting the culture war. It is not our job to fight a culture war. Now, let that sink in and get over the shock of it for a moment, and let me explain why. We're not fighting a culture war. We're not fighting against culture. Culture is not the issue. Culture is a symptom of the real problem. Our culture is a visible manifestation of the real issue. Listen to me. Our battle is not against our culture. Instead, let me tell you what our battle is. It's not in your notes, but I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. Here's the battle. You ready? Ephesians 6.12. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Listen to me, Christian. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world against evil spirits in the heavenly places and some of you are going yeah those evil powers in this world right those stinking politicians those horrible people that are that are ruling our governments those those bosses no it's not a flesh and blood enemy it's not the politicians it's not those people that you fight on social media that bears repeating. Look at me and listen. It's not those people you're fighting on social media. They are not the enemy. It's not those people who believe different than you believe. It's not those people who dress differently than you dress or act differently than you, than you act. That's not the enemy. The enemy is the forces of evils that are being ruled by their commander, Satan. Satan is the ruler of this world. Whoa, whoa, I thought Jesus was the king of kings. We just sang about it. He is. But he is allowing Satan to rule in this world for a period of time. And in this time, guys, that's the battle. Please get this this morning. Your battle is not against politicians, people on social media, people that are different from you. So please quit fighting that battle. You will not win. You will not win that battle. In fact, I'm convinced of this. If Jesus were on social media, if Jesus were on social media, he would use social media to be social, not political or confrontational. He would use it to talk about fun things that are happening, people's birthdays, parties he was going to, places he was going, and things that were happening. But when he needed to confront people, when he needed to talk about issues that were going on, if he were alive today, he would do it just like he did then, face-to-face -face and one-on-one, -on -one, not in the comment section. I kind of expected an amen on that. Please stay out of the comment section. To my knowledge, no one has ever been changed in the comment section. Maybe they have, but I'm not aware of it. Instead, all you get is the mean and the vile and the ugly and the evil and the gross and the bad, and you just get madder and madder and madder and madder, right? I know, because that's not our battle. Yes, we should stand up for what's right. Yes, we should stand up for the truth. Yes, we should stand up for good. But that is measured, hear me, our measurement, our standard for good, for what's right, and all that stuff is God's word. And we use God's word to fight spiritual battles. We are in a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. And we must fight the right way. And when you stand up for what's right, make sure it's by God's word. And make sure that we do it in a, watch this, humble, love-motivated, grace-filled way. What does that mean? That means this. That person that posts that thing, that person that says that thing, that person that believes what they believe and are being all loud and round and round and round about it. God, I hate they feel that way. God, I hate they believe what's wrong. God, I hate it that they are going down the wrong path. And I pray that they would see the light. 
I pray that they would come to know the truth of your word. And God, if you can use me to do it, help me to be humble, grace-filled, love motivated. Does that sound like the comment section? Doesn't, does it? So before we jump in today to be in salt and light, you got to get this. Understand the battle. Understand the times. Understand what's going on. And it's in the midst of that battle that Jesus says you and I are salt and light. Let's talk about those two words. You ready? What does it mean to be salt? Okay, what exactly does that mean? And why would Jesus say that? What does it mean to be salt? Well, understand this. In that culture, when Jesus made the statement, salt had great, great value. It was incredibly valuable. In fact, the Greek word for salt is divine. They saw it as such a, a high standard commodity. It was very, very valuable. The, the, uh, the Latin word for salt is salarius. Salarius, from which we get the word salary. Because Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt. That's how valuable it was. In fact, if a Roman soldier wasn't doing his job, was derelict of his duties, he was said to not be worth his salt. You ever heard that one? Yeah, that's where that came from. This is incredibly valuable. So why did Jesus say, hey, you're to be salt? Well, a lot of people think a lot of different things. Well, salt is white, so that means we should be pure. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. We're going to talk about that in a minute, actually. Uh, salt uh, makes people thirsty, and so we should make them thirst for the love of God in their lives, right? Maybe, maybe yeah. Uh, salt adds flavor, and we as Christians should add flavor, but you and I have been around Christians who are boring, so I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Really, the main purpose of salt in those days was this, and I want you to write this down. The purpose of salt is to preserve. When Jesus said we are to be salt, what probably came into the minds of those people was to preserve. Let's go back and look at verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? By the way, the answer to that is what? No. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Preserve or preservation. Obviously, in those days, they didn't have refrigeration. Okay? So the way they preserved their meat was to pack it in salt. If you're going on a journey across the sea, you pack your fish in salt. If you're going to keep some meat for a period of time after you butchered the whatever it was, they pack it in salt because salt slows decay. To this day, you can still use salt to do this. Salt slows down decay. As Christians in this world, it is our job to slow down the decay of our world. To slow down the decay in our culture. People who say to you that our world is evol evolving, that our, our culture is evolving, that we are, are growing and we are becoming more and more enlightened and becoming better and better and better are wrong. Our culture and our world is devolving. It is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's, that's very biblical. The day is going to come where Jesus is going to say, God's going to say, okay, enough's enough. I'm done with all of this. And he's going to send Jesus back. And going to shut all this down. But our job while we're here is to slow that process down, to be salt, to slow down the process of decay. As Christians, if we are going to help people find and experience God's best effectively, we must distinctively be salt by preserving morality, by preserving ethics, by preserving godly values. And remember, all of those are determined by God's word, not by your feelings. All of that is determined by God's word, not some pol public policy. All of that is determined by God's word and not some political party. We must look to God's word as our marching orders for being salt and preserving our culture. And by the way, if you lose your saltiness, can you get it back? According to what Jesus said, you can't. Once we lose our saltiness, we're only worth being trampled underfoot. Ladies and gentlemen, may I submit to you today that there are a lot of Christians and even a lot of churches and even a lot of denominations in our world that have lost their salt. And the world is trampling them. The world is trampling them and you can't tell any difference. They're no different from the world. They believe the same things and say the same things and invite the same things as the rest of the world, and they've lost their salt. God forbid that Midtown Church loses salt. 
Guys, I don't want us to lose our salt in Saline County. We need to be salt. How do we do that? Let me show you three ways we can do it. You ready? Write it down. We, be, we are salt by contact. Write it down. The first thing there is be, by contact. If salt is going to preserve meat, guess what? It has to be in contact with the meat. And if we're going to preserve our world, we need to be in contact with our world. Look at Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. This is called the Great Commission. These are some of Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven. And look what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Basically, what Jesus is saying is this, go and help people find and experience God's best. Go and tell people about me. Go and tell people how they can be saved. Go and tell people how they can have eternal life and be forgiven. Teach them everything that you know about walking with me so they can experience God's best in every part of their life. And I'm always going to be with you to help you do this. But there's something really important that I want you to see. Go back to that verse up there and see that word go. Circle the word go. That word go literally means as you go. Write that down somewhere up there. As you go. It literally means this. Jesus literally says this. As you're going about your everyday life, as you go to the grocery store, as you go to school, as you go to your job, as you go to the ball field, as you go to the theater, as you go shopping, as you go out to eat, as you go up and down your street, as you go about your everyday life, Josh, our Connections pastor, likes to call it the natural rhythms of life. As you go through the natural rhythms of your life, be salt. Be salt. Tell people about me. You don't need to go on a mission trip. You didn't need to have some special day. As you go about your life, we should be salt. So don't isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself from the rest of the world. Don't isolate yourself from what's going on. You are in the world. You have a circle of influence. You do. Every one of us do. There are people that you hang out with, your family, your friends, your coworkers, whoever it may be. You have a circle of influence. As you go through that influence, be salt. As you come in contact with people, be salt. Let people know that you're different in order to make a difference. We can't just stay here in the church and say, we're salty. Yippee. As you go, sprinkle some salt. As you go. But be careful. Yes, we want to be in contact with the world, but we don't want to be influenced by the world, right? We want to influence, but we don't want to be influenced. And that's the second thing, to be salt. You have to be pure. Stay pure. Write that down. Stay pure. I told you that um, salt was very valuable in the day that Jesus was saying this, and it was used even as, uh, as payment sometimes. But a lot of times, the crooked people, the bad people, the evil people, the people that didn't want to do right and good, would mix salt with white sand. And when salt gets mixed with sand, guess what happens to the salt? It becomes pretty useless, pretty worthless, because it's not pure. And when you allow the things of the world to get mixed into your life, and I allow the things of the world to get mixed in my life, I'm, I, I lose my effectiveness. I, I'm, not, I'm no longer distinct. I'm no longer different. Look, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.21, if you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Pure means free from pollution. Keep yourself pure so that God can use you. Be careful what you allow into your life. We can't go about doing and being and acting and saying what everybody else is, the rest of the world is, and, and keep ourselves distinct from the world. Instead, we pollute ourselves, and we lose our effectiveness, and we won't be able to be salty for God, which is the third thing. Write it down. Be salty. In order to be salt, just be salty. Now, what does that mean? Some of you go, mm-hmm. She is salty, right? You know some salty people. It's not exactly what I mean, but here's what I mean by that. Notice Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. You were created to be salty. So be who God made you. Be who God made you. You have a set of gifts, of talents, and abilities, and skills. Use those to be distinct, to be different for God's glory. You have relationships and connections. Use those to be salty, to, to show people the difference that God has made. Because here's what I know. 
once you've salted something, you can't unsalt it. Once you put pickles on those Chick-fil-A sandwiches, blah, am I right? No pickle on that sandwich, please. Amen? And don't just pull them off. Because that pickle just soaks in the bread and in the batter and the stuff. And, it, and you can open it up and smell it. Right? Jesus didn't say be pickles, but it applies. You can't take the salt out. You can't take the, once the salt is there, you know it's there. So watch this. You are salt. As you go about your days, you go about your life, make sure that you are leaving some salty residue behind. Can people tell when you leave? Can people tell when you leave that there's something different? Can people tell when you walk in the room that there's something different? That's salt. The Bible says it like this in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are not like that. Like what? If you read the verses before this, it's talking about people who disobey God's word. Okay? So in this case, it would be people who are not allowing the salt to happen. You're not like that. You're a chosen people, royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. God has made you salt. That's who you are. Be salty. Be who and what God made you to be. And as you do that, people will see a difference. As you do that, people can tell a difference. And as we do that, we draw them out of the darkness and into God's light. Be salt. But also, he says, we are light. What does it mean to be light? What is exactly Jesus talking about when he says that we are to be light? Now, light is always a symbol of God. Light is always a symbol of good. Light is always the opposite of dark, right? You've got the dark side and the light side. You've got the the good guys and the bad guys, right? You always the dark represents bad and evil and all that, and light and light always represents good and, and everything that happens there. So Jesus is saying, look, there's a whole lot of darkness going on, but we need to be light in the darkness. And this is really important. You ready? As Christians, as people, as individuals, okay, we cannot be light on our own. Instead, we can be moons, Tonight when you go out or the next time you go out at night and you see the moon, think about something with me. It's bright, right, and it's shining and it gives light. But get this, the moon is dead. It has no internal source of power. And yet there's light coming off of it. You know why? You remember this from science, right? The light does what? It reflects the light of the sun. So the sun hits the moon and it bounces off and it gives light to us. You ready for this? We are to reflect the light of God's sun. We can't do this on our own. But if you have Jesus inside of you, we reflect that light to other people. And God has called us out of darkness, because once we were in darkness, we'll talk about that in a second, but now we have the light and we are to let it shine. Look how Jesus said it in verse 14 and 15 of Matthew 5. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. We're out there for everyone to see, whether you like it or not. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In other words, write this down. The purpose of light is to illuminate. The purpose of light is to illuminate. The purpose of light is to come into a dark place and illuminate that. Illuminate a room. You you don't put it under a bushel. You don't hide it. Nothing like that, right? Hide it under a bushel. No. Thank you. All right. So proud of you for that. I wasn't really sure. I thought I'd give it a shot, okay? Some of you that didn't go to vacation Bible school have no idea what's going on here, but that's okay. It's kind of a cult thing. It's all right. (laughs) We don't hide it. We can't keep it. We can't be ashamed of it. We've got to let it out. We've got to let it shine, okay? Because in darkness, what happens? You get lost. You stumble. You fall. You mash your toe on the bedpost, right? Whatever it is. We need light. Our world is dark. You agree? Our world's dark. And our world needs some light. And guess what? You and I are that light. Now, the effects of salt are typically personal and internal and not necessarily seen, but light is very visible. Light is very obvious. And we are called to be salt, yes, and in our personal selves to make sure that purity and that kind of thing happens, but then it comes out as light. So how do we do that? How can we be the light that we're supposed to be. Let's look at three things. Number one is this, be on. 
If you're going to be light, you have to, number one, be on. What do, what do I mean by be on? Here's what I mean. Don't be afraid to let your light shine. Lights are meant to be turned on. What you turn? I got every light in the house is on. What do you think we're made of money around here? Anyone's dad? Anyone? Yeah, right? Now come on, every, every light in the house is on. Right? Well, listen, lights are meant to be on. That's why we have them. So we turn them on. And, and in, in the spiritual world, it's always dark. And we don't have to worry about conserving energy. So we should always be on. Everywhere you go and everything you do, you need to make sure that your light is shining. Don't hide it. Don't turn it off. Turn it on. Everywhere you go, every place you are, there is darkness. I don't care in your house. Yes, there is evil. There is darkness that goes on in your house. Everybody's house. In this building, there's spiritual darkness of battles fighting all the time. There is darkness in our world. And guys, we must be on. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, look what it says. For once you were full of darkness, before Jesus, right, we were all full of darkness. Before Jesus came in as the light of the world, we, we were all that way. But now you have the light from the Lord. Here it is. So live as people of the light. Man, you ought to highlight, circle, underline, tattoo that backwards on your forehead. So when you look in the mirror, you see that. Live as people of light. For this light within you, look at this, produces what's good and right and true. The light produces the good stuff that flows out of us for everybody else to see. Be on. Constantly be plugged into the power. Flip the switch. Make sure that you are on so people can see it because that's what produces the things that people notice that make us different. Number two, dispel the dark. If you're going to be light, you have to dispel the dark. Because here's what we know. Light and dark cannot coexist. Light and dark cannot coexist. You ever notice that? When you open up the refrigerator, it's dark in there with the door closed. If, in case you're wondering, it really does. The light goes out. I, I crawled in there and closed the door. But when you open that door, bing! right? You cannot have light and darkness. You walk into a dark room, flip the switch, the light comes on. What happens to the darkness? It's gone. As Christians, we dispel the darkness because of the light of Jesus. What does that mean for us? Here's what it means. Ephesians 5, 10 through 12. Verse 10 says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Stop right there. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. If I'm going to be salt and I'm going to be light, I'm going to be a godly husband, a godly dad, godly man, godly wife, godly woman, godly student, whatever. If I'm going to be, what, if I'm going to experience God's best, and I'm going to help people find experience God's best, carefully consider what is it that's going to please God? How are my actions, my words, my relationships, my involvement, so how, is that going to, how am I going to please God? So that's, that's my goal. And then look what he says. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Wow. Take no part in what the, what's going on with the world and their evil and their darkness and things that they're doing. Don't, do not take any part. Of, don't be participating in those things. Verse 12 is a powerful verse, one of my all-time favorites. It's shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. Did you know that? Do you know that when they come to work and they start talking about what they did over the weekend... It is ungodly for us to take part in those conversations. Don't even be around that stuff because darkness and light cannot coexist. As Christians, we dispel the darkness. So we walk away. We don't engage. We don't laugh. We don't participate. And people will call you names. Oh, this goody two shoes, right? One of the greatest things somebody said about me when I was in high school, they told one of my buddies they don't hang around with me because... I'm a little too upright. I thought, bam. <laughs> Consider that a huge compliment. What do people say about you? Hey, come here, you'll like this joke. Hey, come here, listen to this. You're going to love this. We've got to be different, guys. And light dispels the darkness. Last one. If I'm going to be light, I have to show the way. If I'm going to be light, I have to show the way. Light the path to God's best. 
We need to light the path to God's best through this dark world. We need to show people how to navigate the darkness. We need to show people how to get through these difficulties. We need to show people how to deal with these situations. And we do that with God's word. Through God's word. And as we learn it, remember, it produces that light in us that helps us show people. We need, we need to live an example. Show people the way to go. Matthew 5, uh, excuse me, Philippians 2, verse 15. B, so that little B right there, by the way, means the last part of the verse, not the whole verse. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. What did you just think of when you read that? What place did you think of? Your home? Your workplace? That restaurant you frequent? Your neighborhood? What, what place did you just think of? That's your place to be light. That's where you get today to start living this out. Not in an arrogant, not in a show-offy, not in an I'm better than you kind of way, but remember our, our, our motivation is love and grace and humility because we don't want people wandering in darkness. We don't want people living in darkness. We want people to experience the light of Jesus, don't we? We want people to find and experience God's best. That means we have to live it and we have to tell it. We have to live it and we have to tell it. Eventually somebody's going to ask you why you're doing that or why you're not doing that. Eventually somebody's going to want to know why you don't participate. Eventually, somebody, you're going to have that opportunity. It's because I've been born by the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't, please don't, okay? Don't. No. That's going to freak everybody out. Honestly, man, I used to do that kind of stuff, and I used to be involved in that, but here's what I know. I'm a Christian, and Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, and to honor him in my life, I can't do that. And it's not a restrictive thing. It's actually a very liberating thing. Because now I get to experience God's best in every part of my life. It's a struggle sometimes. But that's what I've committed myself to do with Jesus. And by the way, if you'd like to talk about that, I can help you know how you can too. But yeah, it's that simple. All right, you ready? Let's wrap it up. What's our big question we ask every week, you guys? Come on. So what? Well, what do I, okay, Doug, light, salt, blah, 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 preserve, okay, illuminate, that's great, but what, what am I, how do I walk out of here today? Great question. Here's our memory verse, you ready? Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Here's what that means. When we live as salt and we live as light, people see it and we give God the glory. What does it say? Who's going to give God the glory? Everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Wouldn't that be amazing? When we're being salt and we're being light, people notice it. We have a chance to tell them about it. They will honor and glorify God. That's the goal. I don't need the credit. I don't need the praise. I don't want it. I want to point everybody to him. Listen, guys, salt and light is not an option. Jesus did not say you could be if you want to. Jesus did not say you might be. He said you what? You are the salt of the earth. You are are the light of the world it's not an option it's an obligation if you're a christian you have no choice you are don't lose your saltiness don't hide your light instead here's your so what you ready shake the shaker and flip the switch you'll remember this one won't you shake the shaker and flip the switch listen we are sitting in the salt shaker right now aren't we church is the salt shaker i pray that we get shaken up today and that the salt spills out everywhere we go. I pray today you will take the cover off of the light and let it shine. Wherever you go, whatever you do. What does that look like? Grab your connection card and flip it over on the back for me, okay? You already filled out the front, I hope. But look at the back. Down there toward the bottom, there's a thing called my personal so what. You ready? This is where it's going to get real. This is where we're going to shake the shaker and flip the switch. You ready? This is a way for you to communicate to me and our pastors. We don't share this with our whole staff. Never leaves our office. We want to know how did God speak to you and what are you going to do about it so we can pray for you and we can try to encourage you and help you, okay? So how are you going to flip the switch? How are you going to shake the shaker this week? Maybe this week you're going to stop taking part in those conversations. Maybe this week you're going to quit going to that place. Maybe you're going to cut out that habit. Maybe this week as you go, you're going to look for ways to sprinkle some salt and you're going to make that your prayer. 
God, help me as I go to sprinkle salt everywhere I go. God, help me this week in my home to show love, to show grace. God, help me to stay off the comment section. That'd be a miracle for some of you guys. And I'm not making light. I'm not. I'm not making fun of you. That would be huge for you. I think it would be fantastic. Yeah, I know. Play on words. And I think it would be huge for some of us. Right? Instead, make an appointment. Hey, listen, I saw what you wrote on Facebook the other day. I have some questions about that. If you have that kind of relationship with that person, that's what you ought to be doing anyway. Make an appointment. Talk to them. Why? Because you love them and you want them to experience the light. You want them to be salt too. You want them to experience God's best. When you have the opportunity this week, I'm going to be salt and light this week, and when I have the opportunity, I'm going to tell people that it's because of Jesus. Double dog dare you. Double dog dare you. And then let us know how it goes. Write it down so we can pray for you. And let's see what God's going to do. You ready? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for making us salt and light. Not an option, an obligation. It's, it's literally who we are because you are in us through Jesus Christ and the power of your spirit. And so, God, I pray that each and every man, each and every woman, every student in this room, that, God, this week, starting right now, today, as we walk out of this building, we would flip the switch and shake the shaker. That, God, we would be salt and light for your glory. Not be afraid, not be ashamed. Use us. Father, I pray if there's people who are watching online today or people who are in this room who have never truly put their faith in Jesus for salvation, that through this message, maybe, God, your Holy Spirit has convicted them and that they would turn from their sin right now and say, Jesus, I turn to you and I receive what you did on the cross. I accept what you did on the cross. Help me to be salt and light for you. God, lead us to your best. We will always give you the glory for it. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for listening so well. Thanks for being here today. Hold tight for just a second. Josh wants to share a couple of things before we go. Awesome. Before we leave, we get to want to celebrate something together as a church. As Doug just prayed, we always pray that people would, uh, because of hearing the message from God's word, would give their life to Jesus for the very first time. And we just want to let you know that over the last several weeks, we have had multiple people let us know on their connection card they've given their life to Jesus for the very first time. And So let's celebrate that and praise God for that. So we get to follow up with them, which is super fun. So if you made one of these spiritual decisions on the back of your connection card, please let us know. Our pastors look forward to following up with you uh, this week. Those of you online, you can go to our website, click the Connect tab, and do the same thing on your online connection card. Well, volunteers, if you would make your way to your places, and thank you again for serving today. And uh, On your way out, drop your connection card, your two offering envelopes, and one of the baskets in the back of the room. If you're a guest with us for the first time, Take your connection card back to that table where you got your worship guide. There'll be a volunteer there to give you a gift as you go. Okay? You guys are dismissed. Have a great day.